I'm J.G. Michael, and this is Parallax Views. Hello, this is Mike Swanson, and in a few moments, you're going to listen to another segment of Parallax Views. But before you do that, let me tell you about my new book, Why the Vietnam War. It's a sequel to my previous book called The War State, which has lots of positive reviews and Amazon's been out for years. But this one is a more detailed case study of how American empire and national security state operate using Vietnam. And I believe it shows also how things work today, how policy is actually made and why. So grab the book on Amazon.com, Why the Vietnam War. This edition of Parallax Views is brought to you by our wonderful sponsors at the $10 tier and above of my Patreon page at patreon.com slash parallaxviews. Once again, that's patreon.com slash parallaxviews. Producers, credit shoutouts to Mark, Arlen, Spartacus, Gunner, Ed, Gratz, James, Mickey, Brian, The War Nerd, The 42 Group, Nick, Emilia, Chase, Chris, Orc, Black Tuna, Nobody, David, Holland, Martin, Stu, Jeffrey, Thomas, Elliot, Colin, Michael, Matthew Ho, Brace Belden, Galen, Justin, Nick W, Chance, and the Mayor, M-E-E-R, Project. If you'd like to join those listeners in getting your very own producer's credit on each and every edition of Parallax Views, Consider joining them in supporting me at the $10 tier or above on my Patreon page at patreon.com slash parallaxviews. One more time, patreon.com slash parallaxviews. And now, on to the show. Hey there, Parallax Vias listeners. On this edition of the program, we're going to be speaking with not one, but two different guests in two different segments. Yes, it's a double feature. Later on in the program, we'll be hearing from Steve Grumbine, founder of Real Progressives on a number of topics, including MMT, unionization, and resisting the doom pill. But first... Kim Kelly, otherwise known as Grim Kim, a longtime black metal fan and labor reporter, joins us to discuss her new book, Fight Like Hell, The Untold History of American Labor. Welcome to Parallax Views, a guest that I've wanted to have on for a long time. Kim Kelly, also known as Grim Kim, author of Fight Like Hell, The Untold History of American Labor. How are you doing today? I'm good. It's, uh, it's not raining as hard as it was yesterday, so sun is shining in South Philadelphia. So I want to get into this book, but the first question I have to ask you is, what's your favorite black metal band? Because I, I know you're known in the black metal scene. That's where he came from. Gosh, I mean, there's a million answers to that, but I always have to default to Bathory. Oh, right on, right on, right. Classic. (laughs) So then how did you go from reporting on, you know, the the black metal music scene uh to labor? And and I know your your family has a history in the labor movement, I believe. Sure. Well, I'm from a union family. So my dad, my uncles, my grandparents, uh, basically my whole family orbit uh, are in unions and construction and steel workers and teachers. So I always kind of had that firm base of knowing that, you know, unions are a good thing. They've got your back. They make life better. 
just basic truths that I think a lot of kids in this country don't get to grow up with just because of the way that density has fallen in the labor movement. But um, yeah, so I, I was always like pro-union without really thinking about it, but because of my job, which was just, well, <laughs> I've had a bunch of jobs, but I guess my main job writing, uh, specifically when I started working at Vice as Noisy's heavy metal editor, I never really thought about the idea of joining a union just because I didn't think they made unions for people like me, like people who write about heavy metal on the internet. But it turns out they did. And we organized my workplace at Vice. And um, like 2015, we started organizing. 2016, we ratified, we got our first contract and I got super involved in that whole process. And throughout that whole period that I was at Vice, I was freelancing a lot because they didn't pay me very much. And I do have a variety of interests and among them labor and politics, but I never felt like I really had much credibility in that world. So it's like, okay, like I spent my whole life writing about heavy metal. Why would anyone want to commission an article about unions or something for me? And it wasn't until I had that hands-on experience of organizing and going to every meeting and bargaining, doing all the stuff that comes with joining or organizing a union that I kind of felt like, oh, maybe I do know a little something about this. Maybe if I send out a pitch to an editor, like, hey, I'm Kim, I'm part of the Vice Union, I would like to write this, maybe that would work. And it did. And I just started writing a little bit more about labor stuff on the side and reading a lot of labor books and talking to more labor organizers and really just diving in to the point where I was really going to more union meetings and heavy metal shows. And by the time I got laid off in early 2019, I had kind of gone from- I, I remember uh, that. That was a very big fiasco. Oh my God. Ugh. Bloodbath. But by the time I got laid off, I had kind of gone from being this heavy metal journalist with an interest in labor and politics to kind of being a labor and politics writer with a big interest in heavy metal. And I decided, okay, let's just try it. Like maybe I'm just going to try and be a labor reporter now. And by that point, I built up enough experience and enough clips that I, I kind of was able to pull it off. And here we are. What were your own personal experiences with organizing and doing union work? And then we'll get into some of the stories of the people you cover in the book. Sure. I mean, it all started for me when a couple of coworkers came up and asked me like, hey, do you want to get coffee? We want to talk to you about something. I said, hey, we, I think we want to organize a union here. What do you think about that? And my first thought was like, oh, hell yeah, what can I do? And so I, I became part of all the, the meetings and committees, like we had a diversity committee, we had a labor management committee, we had so many committees. And we spent a lot of time talking to our coworkers and uh, gauging what, what, what their problems were, what their interests were and putting together a pattern of demands, which is like your kind of your first step towards getting a contract. We figured out what we wanted. And then we had to sit down with the bosses and bargain with them and see what we could get. And I got to go through two different bargaining sessions, like for our first two contracts and you know, helped organize other people in advice. I think about 400 TV and production people we were managed to bring in. I went to other shops and talked to other, uh, other digital media people about the idea of joining our union and helped kind of walk them through that process. It's um, what were the challenges of it though, maybe? The biggest thing that I encountered, it wasn't that people were explicitly anti-union. I never really encountered that. It was that so many people had no idea what a union was and why they should be interested in it and you know what it could do for them because a lot of people in that you know the demographic of people that work in new york city newsrooms maybe don't necessarily come from union households or they do but they just didn't learn very much about it or it didn't seem interesting they just didn't know the history and know how it could apply to them and that was at a point where they're like we knew that there were newspapers and some legacy magazines that were organized but there wasn't a lot going on in the, in the digital media world we were kind of the beginning of that wave. So it's really just educating people about what unions are, how they can help, and why we should fight so hard to get one. Yeah, it reminds me, I, I remember I was doing a, a college radio show at one point. Mm, I did college radio too. With a bunch of uh, friends of mine. And I remember I brought up unions because I, I, I come from Pittsburgh and you know there's oh, yeah. still a lot of unions there. You know, my grandpa was a union guy. So I mentioned unions the one time during the show and someone said, do unions still even exist? And my head just about exploded. It's like people don't even realize that, you know, union that's organizing the, can still be a thing. That's the thing though. So many people grow up, if they hear about unions at all, it's either like negative propaganda or they think of it as just, oh, like construction workers or like people that work in the coal mines. Like that wouldn't apply to my life. Like those, those aren't, unions aren't something that people in my position could benefit from. 
but everybody can benefit from a union. That's the thing. It's like the people in power don't want you to think that you can organize collectively, but you totally can. It's in the law and everything. So that that brings me to this uh, thing. We, we saw uh, Chris Smalls uh, with his uh, successful Amazon labor union uh, push recently. And, you know, there was the freak out by people like Jim Cramer saying, oh, the, the unions are going to tell you when you have to go to work. And, you know, I, I think he was drunk on CNBC that night because he looked out of it. But what do you think the for, for people that have this knee jerk reaction or they just have only heard the propaganda? What are the benefits of unions? Well, you're always stronger when there's other people standing next, next to you, right? Like if you walk in your boss's office and say, hey, I want a raise. I deserve a raise. Your boss can tell you, oh, okay, go fuck yourself. I'm not doing that. But if, you know, 30 or 40 or 200 of you and your coworkers come together and tell your boss, hey, we need a raise, he has to listen because it's very much in his best interest because he's seen that you've built power, that you're working collectively, that you're all, you all have each other's backs. It is so much harder to navigate the capitalist hellscape we're trapped within as an individual. But as a group, as someone who is part of something a little bit bigger, you can force those changes. Like we are, you know, an injury to one is an injury to all. That matters. Having people that have your back really matters, especially when you're going toe to toe with a capitalist class. So in regards to Fight Like Hell, you start out with uh, this character of Jennifer Bates. Uh, mm. For people who don't know, who is Jennifer Bates? And then I want to get into some of the characters that are maybe lesser known, because I, I think people, if they do know about unions, right, they'll know about Eugene Debs, or they'll know about Caesar Chavez. I hope so. <laughs> but there's so many union people and organizers that, you know, get lost in the shuffle or that we uh, don't always recognize as much as we should. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Jennifer Bates, then some of the voices that we may not be familiar with. Sure. I mean, Jennifer, she's incredible. She's one of the workers at Amazon's warehouse in Bessemer, Alabama, who led not only the first effort to unionize there, but the second one too. Like she is really the mother of that movement. She's incredible. She has, a, she's been working since she was a child she had previously worked in a factory that was unionized under the steel worker. So she came into it with this, this experience. And she's just a really charismatic, brilliant, vivacious woman who has been able to really effectively organize and communicate with her coworkers and, and speak to the press and became kind of a public face of the campaign. And we're actually still waiting to hear whether or not they won their second election. There's a bunch of um, kind of legal stuff and challenge ballots that they need to go through. And hopefully they will. But even if they don't, I know that they've built something really special there. And I know that Jennifer is destined for some really great things. I know she wants to run for public office. Like she's just a powerhouse. And I'm really grateful I got to meet her throughout the course of my reporting. And what was the main takeaway uh, you got from speaking with her and, and reporting on her story? Well, so much of the labor struggle and the struggle between labor and capital it, it, and just the struggle of everyday workers trying to make things a little bit better, it comes down to respect, to being treated like people, not robots, the way Amazon does, to being you know, paid decent money for a decent day's work, to be covered when you're sick, to be able to work in conditions that are not conducive to you getting sick or injured. It's all so basic that no one is asking for anything untoward or above and beyond. It's really just people asking to be treated with dignity and respect and paid what they're worth, which is so much more than what they're getting. You know, Jennifer explicitly connected their struggle with that of the civil rights movement, Dr. Luther King Jr. And she mentioned, you know, the fact that Dr. King's last, one of his last speeches, one of his last actions on earth was to address striking sanitation workers in Memphis, I think the day before he was assassinated. And, you know, we were talking, we were in this park in downtown Birmingham. That's like a, I can't remember the exact name, but it's like a tribute to the civil rights movement. And we were walking by this statue of Dr. King and she was like, you know, we're, we're doing the same thing here. Like, this is all one, the same connected struggle. And I thought it was really important and, and really lovely. Yeah, that reminds me because I think it was Dr. King that talked about, you know, we have to combine the economic struggle and the anti-war struggle and the civil rights struggle, it, we sort of have to triangulate them. 
And I think that's what we need to do today as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, speaking of, you know, bringing all that together under within the context of the civil rights movement, one of the people in the book that I was really excited to write about is Baird Rustin, who is basically the architect of the, the, the whole name was like a, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. It was an economic march as well as a freedom struggle. And he was a queer black man who was completely instrumental in making the whole thing happen. He was the only person in that cohort who had the organizing experience and know how to get it done. That's what Dr. King and his, um, you know, his comrades, they were like, okay, Baird is the only one who can pull this off. And he did. But just the fact of his identity, the fact that he was an out and proud queer man in that time, he was kind of pushed out of the spotlight, even by people he worked with, because they couldn't accept his, quote unquote, his lifestyle could accept who he was and he's one of the characters in the book that was denied their chance to shine and their due recognition just because of who they were and you know I hope that we get to a point where Baird Rustin's name is just as well known as Cesar Chavez or other labor leaders hopefully this book will help you know it, it's so funny you mentioned Baird Rustin because um, one of my professors in university he, he was like an old uh, old school socialist uh, but one of the organizers he would always talk about was Beard Rustin, uh, mm. this professor Paul LeBlanc. So uh, it, it's interesting. You are sort of bringing to light a lot of figures that are lesser known, especially uh, when it comes to women. So could you talk about the role of women in the labor movement? Uh, <laughs> do you want to narrow your question a little bit? Because we've been out here since the beginning. Well, that th this is true. Uh, well, I, the, well, like I said, we've always been here is the thing. Women and non-binary people, trans people have always been part of the labor movement from day one because we've always worked. And well, that's not fair to say. In this country, white women have not always worked. Poor white women have worked. Uh, people, women have worked at domestic labor, reproductive labor. But for a really long time, women of a certain class, white women of a certain class were encouraged to stay home. And it was unheard of that they would go to work. But women of color have always been forced to labor in this country. And there's just so many different, you know, there's so many threads connecting so many different women who are in this book. And I was happy that I was able to shift the focus and spotlight women specifically, because there, there are so many, you know, brilliant scholars and historians who have already done this kind of work and excavated these stories and archives and, and kind of put together a lot of these narratives. But what I was trying to do with this book was kind of pull them all together in one easily accessible place. And I wanted to show women and people of color and queer people, so many types of people and workers in this country who, you know, if they pick up a mainstream labor book in Barnes and Noble, they, the likelihood they're gonna see someone like them in those pages is a little lower. So I wanted to put it all together into one book they could pick up and take on the bus or the subway on the way to work and find someone who looked like them and take inspiration from that, whether they're a woman or any other type of marginalized person in this country. Forgive me for, for not narrowing the question earlier. I guess mm. I, I was wondering if there were any women in particular that you covered in the book that really stood out to you or that resonated with you. And then I had mm. another question that actually tied into, it's interesting to me that a lot of times we talk about the labor movement but a lot of the LGBTQ voices and the civil rights voices that revolved in the labor movement, sometimes I think we don't um, put the spotlight on them enough. And I wanna talk about that, but first, uh, were there any particular uh, women within the labor movement that really resonated with you while you were researching this book? There's this one woman in Ohio and she wasn't even necessarily involved in organized labor, but she was, just this, she was so cool. Um, this woman named Ida Mae Stull, who uh, she's from a little coal town in Ohio in the 1930s. She grew up, you know, coal miner's daughter, followed her dad into the mines. She was, she was a coal miner when that was not really something that women did. And she was so good at it. And she loved her job so much that people in her community were like, well, okay, that's just what Ida does. But uh, there were actually laws on the books at that time that said that women in Ohio were not permitted to engage in heavy labor among, and mining was one of those, you know, restricted occupations. And once the, you know, the 
the mine inspectors caught on. They're like, oh, there's a woman working in this mine. Like, we can't be having that. And they came in and they pulled her out. And at first she tried to <laughs> chase them away with rotten eggs. But unfortunately, the long arm of the law caught up with her. And she had to go to court and fight for her right just to do her job. But she actually won. And she got to go back down in the mines where she wanted to be. And That's pretty I- metal. It's so, it was so sick. And she has such like incredible quotes that they're just so tough. Uh, I don't have, have any on the top of my head, but there's a couple of quotes from her those that are just like, yes, she's like, I prefer uh, something like, like, I would rather have my face covered in coal dust than powder, things like that. Like she was like a, a very strong, like was not someone that you would mess with. So hearing these, these men in power say, oh, you need to go back to the kitchen. She was not having that. And, but her fighting that battle and saying that precedent you know, kind of laid the groundwork for other women much later to go and take that job and other heavy industry jobs if they wanted to. Like everything builds on everything else. And, you know, there's a direct line between Ida Mae Stoll in Ohio and the women coal miners on strike in Alabama right now that I've been covering for the past year. Like everything is really connected in ways that are really interesting and intricate. And it's, it's really fun to dig up those connections. So since we were talking about how you cover, uh, I mean, you even cover uh, people that are involved with organizing um, for disability rights as as, uh, members of uh, unions. And I guess what's interesting to me is a lot of people, when you mention unions, I'll get this pushback where people say, "Uh, the unions have their own problem. They're they're all a bunch of white racist guys. They, they, they have this problem with marginalized people. And I think that's, I've, I've met people in unions where I think that is a problem with some union members sure. I've met. But I don't think that's the full story. And I, I know you've sort of uh, tussled with people on Twitter over this issue. So maybe you could speak to it a little bit. Sure. I think in this country, there's this kind of avatar of what a working class person looks like or what a union member looks like. And for a lot of people, that idea still centers on like, you know, straight white dude in a hard hat, big burly guy who like runs a machine or does heavy labor. And that, you know, that image goes back to like the earlier decades in labor when manufacturing is huge, when auto working plants and, you know, steel mills and just all of these big heavy machinery entities existed where a lot of people worked and they were heavily unionized but even then like it wasn't just white guys i mean the radical history of black and arab auto workers in detroit alone has spawned so many books like you should read um detroit uh, i don't mind dying it's it's just a really good book about all the black and arab auto workers organizing and fighting in detroit in the 60s but all that to say is like it's it's easier for the people in power to divide us and make us think that unions and collective bargaining aren't accessible or aren't applicable to most people's working conditions because they don't want us to do it. I mean, the fact is that I think Black women have the highest rate of union membership in the country. Like, every every person who has had to work in this country and who has and is going to have to work or has worked deserves a union, but you know, the, the reliance on like weird Republicans and even Democrats that fetishize this one specific idea of what a union member is, that doesn't help anybody because the working class is predominantly brown and black and female at this point and also unionized and also have been part of these struggles since the jump. It's, it's just silly to look out at the landscape of workers in this country and think, okay, only this one specific type of worker counts and needs unions everyone else i don't know figure it out like no they've been figuring it out for centuries because of those attitudes and i like the title being fight like hell because i think people forget when we say it's a struggle it really was a struggle i mean there's a lot of uh there's a lot of blood that is dropped blood and dynamite (laughs) yeah i mean that's the thing it's yeah, being a part of the labor movement can mean a lot of endless meetings and contentious Zoom calls and petitions and long, long shifts standing in a parking lot. But 
it has and certainly still can get a little spicier. I mean, there are a lot of folks in my book who unfortunately became martyrs to the cause because they were shot and killed or otherwise murdered on the picket line or as part of these struggles. I mean, there's this one case in a book, someone that I really hope more people learn about, either as a result of my book or whatever else they choose to read. Uh, this young Yemeni immigrant man named uh, Nagi Daifula, who was super involved with the United Farm Workers during the salad bowl strike. And he was just this really enthusiastic, really talented young person. He was like 24, who served as an interpreter because at that, uh, at that point, there were a lot of Yemeni immigrants who had moved into that part of California and were part of the strike and part of the farm workers movement there. And he was helping translate and bridge those gaps. And he, one day he was just standing with a couple other striking workers. I think it was outside a convenience store or something like that. And the cops showed up, started hassling them. And he stood up for them, told them, you know, get out of here, leave us alone. And the cops responded to that by bashing in his skull and dragging his body across the asphalt and killing him. And that is the kind of story that, you know, it's not pretty, it's not nice to read about, but it's important because of everything that young man gave for the movement and what was taken from him and taken from the movement by, you know, by state violence. And I don't even know if those cops ever got punished, but, you know, his, his death, it did have a ripple impact on the community and on that movement. Like you'll you have to read more about it in the book, but his life was really important. And a lot of really, really important lives were lost in this, like in the service of this struggle, in the service of other people. And I think that's important to remember too. You know, it's, it really is a struggle sometimes. Just a few more really brief questions here. So when you've been reporting on the ground and talking to people involved in the labor movement, you know, uh, people come from all different cultures, uh, different upbringings, different viewpoints. How do we sort of overcome those differences? Because at the end of the day, and maybe I'm old school with this, I feel like it's, you know, the, the laborers uh, versus the people exploiting the laborers. So in what mm-hmm. ways can we sort of negotiate with each other and also understand each other and not do harm to each other and be respectful of each other? And, and what have you seen uh, in your reporting on this where that has, has sort of happened. Uh, what, what gives you hope, I guess? Sure, I mean, there's two examples that spring to mind. One very recent, one a little further back. I mean, just reading interviews and seeing the Amazon labor union organizers speak about what they did to build community and build solidarity among their workers, their fellow workers in Staten Island, where you know they had parties, they had barbecues, they made sure that people spoke one another's languages, they brought food. They built a really solid community and kind of built the the labor aspect from there. Like it was all interconnected. They listened to people. They met them where they were. They showed the similarities between one another and they talked through the differences. And that's why they won. And that's basically, that's how you win. You know, dividing, being divisive or ignoring specific workers' concerns is a great way to lose. You know, back in 1946 in Hawaii, we had the Great Sugar Strike, which was a huge deal. At the time, basically all of the, the big sugar cane plantations on, on the islands were owned by these white European or American-born dudes. And they were worked by immigrant and first-generation laborers from all across Asia and Puerto Rico. There are Native Hawaiians that worked there. But it was a huge ethnic, multicultural jumble of people working in these horrible, hot, brutal sugarcane fields. And at that point, 946, they had a union. They're part of the IL, the ILWU, International Longshore and Warehouse Union. <laughs> it was a tongue twister. But uh, essentially, it got, it got time for them to strike. And these workers, at, at their place of work, they were separated. They, they lived in separate camps, like work camps for Chinese and Japanese and Korean and Puerto Rican and Filipino workers. Like everyone was, was kind of pushed together because bosses didn't want them to get to know one another or to see their similarities or to, you know, make friends because that would weaken the boss's hold over them. But when that, when it came time to strike, they explicitly crossed all of those ethnic lines and linguistic lines. And they made sure that people were giving meetings in 
in a variety of languages and sharing food and sharing culinary traditions. And it's kind of that same principle of meeting people where they are as people, getting to know them, getting to know what matters to them, where they're coming from, what their concerns are, and then finding ways to work through them together. Like this really is, it's called collective bargaining for a reason. It's a collective effort. Like you don't leave anybody out unless they're causing direct harm to other people. And then, you know, sometimes you can, you can, you can make those decisions, right? But also, but most of the time you can find that common ground, you can build on that, you can find the most important issues and the most important similarities and come together and really fight for what will benefit everyone. Like we've done it before, people in, uh, in the Amazon labor union are doing it now and hopefully people will continue to do that because we're always stronger together and solidarity is always our greatest weapon. So the one thing I really wanted to ask you about, because I, I recall it coming up on Twitter uh, a while back, and I, I was sort of amazed that people were attacking, they, they were attacking this article you wrote for the nation. And mm. uh, they were saying, oh, but this one person that was uh, involved with the, the, the coal miners in Alabama, uh, they had voted mm. for Trump. And mm. I, I think you had the best response. Well, now those people, because they're talking to people like yourself, now they're thinking about not voting for Trump. And I was wondering if you could maybe speak to that about, you know, I, I think we do have to get people to change their, their politics or, or realize like who's exploiting them and who's on their side and who isn't. Yeah. And I think one of the, and I've spent a lot of time in like anarchist and anti-fascist circles. Like I, it is, it's kind of funny in a, in a dark way that before I started going down to, to Brooklyn, Alabama, the only other time I'd been around that many Trump supporters was at a protest or, uh, well, at my family Christmas. Cause I'm, so you world. have sort of had to deal with like, yeah, my whole family's pretty conservative, rural, like we're a bunch of rednecks in, in every sense of that, like the good and the bad. And so like, yeah, coming from that background and like having to deal with my dad and deal with my granddad, like I, I know how, it, how to converse with folks who are from a very different perspective and to try and find things we can still talk about. And that's kind of how it felt when I first started going down there because I didn't know anybody. But as the strike has gone on, I've seen and then like had in-depth conversations with folks who at the beginning of the strike would definitely have described themselves as conservative Republicans, you know, like voted for Trump, all of that. But now throughout the course of the strike, as they've seen what it really means to be in a fighting union, as they've seen what solidarity looks like, as they they've come to understand concepts like mutual aid, which I think most people understand that anyway, but putting a name to it and learning a little bit about where it comes from. And also just seeing who has showed up and who hasn't. You know, the Birmingham DSA and local uh, like socialist groups have showed up and have done fundraisers and come out to their rallies they you know they've raised money for them online bernie sanders has been one of their bigger supporters which is kind of wild given how i'm sure a lot of people in the very beginning saw bernie sanders like it's it's there's been a shift because people people understand and notice who shows up for them and who cares and who doesn't the only attention they've gotten from local Alabama politicians like republicans has been one of them the uh, senator tommy tuberville stood up in this congressional hearing that was called to discuss the strike and the role of private equity on crushing the American working class. And he basically rattled off a bunch of talking points from the company. Like he, and then he had the audacity to try and shake one of the striking miners' hands after. It's just people understand who's on their side. And if you show up and make an effort and show that, you know, solidarity is an action and Yes, there's things we disagree on and we're going to talk about those. But right now, while you're fighting for your basic rights and you're fighting to keep a job and keep a roof over your head, like let's take care of these material needs. And then hopefully we can have a good reason conversation about all the things we disagree about. You know, as long as you're not causing active harm to anybody, like we should be there trying to help you because if you're there for the working class, you got to be there for the whole working class. So in closing, I just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, the latest developments uh, with Christian Smalls. And where do you think uh, the labor movement is heading? I know we, we talked about it at the beginning. There's so many people that, that will, you know, sort of look at you askance. They'll say, what do you mean? There's still unions. But I, I don't know. I think I think this is a big development with Christian Smalls. I mean, he is incredible. He makes me think of like the big, bold, like 
early 20th century leaders like he's like a big bill haywood with like a gold chain he's awesome um him and derek palmer and everybody on that committee have done such incredible work and they've really what they've done at staten island has really injected a new sense of hope into the movement i think a lot of people like coming well we're still in the pandemic but coming out hopefully of some of the worst of the pandemic i think people were really really needed something to give them hope and something to give them just a little bit of just a little bit of oomph you know it's been a really rough year for a lot of people some much worse than others and just seeing these workers take on david or take on goliath and win take on jeff bezos this sort of caricature of like an evil oligarch and win that's really inspiring and that's really important and the most important thing about it was seeing that this group of multi-generational multi-racial multi-gender workers working class workers come together and organize basically just do it themselves and win i think that shows that anyone else can do it too if they work hard enough and they learn from some of these lessons they can do it in healthcare, education yeah this is the thing so many people have already done this like you can do it too they, we have always faced an uphill climb. We have always faced, you know, evil oligarchs who try to control us and keep their boots on our neck. But people have always found ways to win and we'll do it again. And whether it's at Amazon or at Starbucks or at Walmart or in the Alabama coal mines, like we're gonna win. We just have to fight like hell to get there. And the last thing I'll say, and, and I'm still working through the book, what I really appreciated about Fight Like Hell was, you know, I, we hear all these politicians say, oh, the, the white working class, the white working. Mm. I hate that term. The, to me, there is no white working class. There is just the working class. And I think in highlighting the struggles from the perspectives of all kinds of different people from all walks of life, you're showing that, yeah, there is just one working class. It isn't white, black, it's, it's just the working class. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of the goal, right? Just like, I, I want any kind of worker to be able to pick this book up and flip through the pages and find something, someone in there that speaks to them and shows them like, oh, people just like me have done this before. Like whether it's a black trans worker or, you know, a queer sex worker or a Alabama coal miner, like, you're in there because you're in this. You're part of this history. Labor history belongs to all of us because it's like, because we built it. It's built on our blood, sweat, and tears. There's always been us against them, good against evil, labor against capital. That's not going to change anytime soon. But I think going back through the past and connecting that to the present and just showing how many people and how many kinds of people have been fighting and winning these battles for such a long time. I mean, that's kind of exciting, right? Like, We've done it before and hell, maybe we can do it again. Well, Kim Kelly, I want to thank you again for coming on Parallax Views. And also I concur with you, Bathory is probably my favorite black metal band too. <laughs> you can't mess with a classic. Hey there, Parallax Views listeners. Next up, we're going to be speaking with Steve Grumbine of Real Progressives about MMT how he went from Reaganite bootstrapper to left-wing politics, resisting the doom pill, and hopes for unionization in light of the recent victory made by Chris Smalls and the Amazon Labor Union. With that being said, let's get right to the conversation with Steve Grumbine, founder of Real Progressives and also host of the fascinating programs, The Rogue Scholar and the Macro and Cheese podcast, as well as a regular on Status Coup News with his very own segment, Let's Get Ready to Grumble. Welcome to Parallax Views, a guest that I'm very interested in speaking with. I've been following his show, Macro and Cheese, a really interesting podcast, and also uh, the Rogue Scholar on Twitter. Uh, Steve D. Grumbine, founder of Real Progressives. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? Thanks for having me on. So 
it's interesting to me, I guess, uh, in terms of your background, uh, you were initially a, a sort of conservative Republican, uh, according yeah. to real progressives who uh, revered Reagan and, and, and the Bushes. Uh, but that all changed with the global financial crisis. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I, it's funny, you know, Facebook uh, has a way of telling on you. My memories came up today. And uh, one of the funny pictures was one of my Bush 2000 shirts, Bush Cheney 2000 shirts. And uh, this came up from 2010. And, um, you know, I was still very much on my journey. I wasn't where I am today, for sure. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't understand economics really yet. I mean, I had an MBA and I definitely knew less about economics with an MBA than I do, uh, you know, as an MMT or now. Um, but, uh, you know, just looking back at the history, I grew up on Reagan and, uh, you know, reduced the deficit and probably every gold bug minded idea you could have. Uh, my first trip outside of the Republican Party took me to Ron Paul, who was sort of a Republican because he had nowhere else to run. Um, I did a drive by through the uh, Democratic Party. Um, I guess I'm still technically a Democrat because in Pennsylvania, they don't even allow the Green Party access. There's, you're you're screwed. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, it's I, you know, I, I think you learn through life. You can read papers, you can read the news and you get a very faulty idea of what the world's about when you get to live and experience the things people are talking about, it gives you a different frame. And so a lot of things were converging at the same time, uh, 2000, it, well, July 24th, 2009, I lost a 17 year career at Verizon. Now I put my name, I volunteered, I raised my hand and said, put me on the list, you know, for a riff. Uh, I, I did not think they'd take me up on it. Number one. Uh, but number two, I just got my second master's degree and figured, hell, I've got certifications. My my signage at the bottom of my email was like wrapping around with all the certifications. I'll be fine. At least I thought I'd be fine. There's no way a guy as qualified as me couldn't be fine, right? And uh, the uh, process of living that out in real time, crawling on the floor as process servers were trying to foreclose on me, uh, having a car. Now, mind you, this is the this is the real split dichotomy here. I had a BMW 330i from a prior life. BMW 330i, most people aren't crying about you. You know, hey, dude's got it going on. He's got a BMW. I had no reverse. And it was from a prior life when I was employed. And so here's this car that I can't sell, can't get rid of or nothing, has no reverse. And I'm coasting in parking lots trying to park going up a hill, rolling backwards to get in the spot. So a lot of real life experiences, my grass grew taller than I was. I had people calling the township on me because I was an eyesore. I was like, oh my God, I had trash piled up. I was caught burning trash because I couldn't afford a trash service anymore. Uh, my teeth started cracking and rotting out of my mouth and uh, literally shards of tooth would come out and be like, what's going on with that? And, and so just one thing led to another, led to another. And then I was brought into this modern monetary theory world. And I heard about it. I knew about it. And I was getting my feet wet on it. But I didn't fully understand the implications of it. And I had no leftist theory whatsoever. I hadn't studied Marx. I hadn't studied Lenin. I was still a dyed-in-the-wool, anti-communist, uh, anti-socialist kind of guy. Those words were very charged words. Um, but that process really began in earnest because of understanding MMT and living the experience that I had never had to experience at that point. And so it, it started really putting things in perspective. And as it gained a more global understanding of the struggle of other people, people with even less, you know, I mean, again, I worked my ass off. I was a drug addict, an alcoholic, uh, a real screw up. Um, and because of having a good, solid family, I was able to get by. Sometimes they were, they would bail me out. They would save me from myself. Uh, I think the big, um, one of the biggest aha moments was back in 2002. Uh, this is leading up to me 
converting. Like I'm already in process a little bit, not completely there, but li- getting there. You're getting uh, outside in, the sort of um, the bootstrapper ideology. Yeah. Exactly. And so in 2002, December 14th, 2002, not to put too fine a point on it, um, I had written a hundred page uh, thesis for my grad school from my master of science that I got. And my computer died, literally gave up the ghost. They all, the, the hard drive was wiped out at midnight, hundred page paper that was due the next day. And so I went out and ended eight years of sobriety that night, got drunk, got arrested, uh, had two ounces of marijuana sitting there cutting quarters in my front seat. Didn't even think twice about it because I was just an old dude. I wasn't trying to deal or anything like this, but there I was drunk as a skunk had bought this stuff in a blackout and I get pulled over by a police officer. And the story behind that's really kind of funny. Um, I, I sat there was going in to buy cigarettes and I lean over to the cash register and I'm like, do you think he knows I'm drunk guy goes, well, if he didn't, I think he does now. (laughs) And uh, so the guy comes over, gives me the old back rub and uh, says, tell you what, it's December 14th. We'll call this Christmas. Go out there and make a phone call and we'll pretend this didn't happen. Okay. I said, thank you so much, Mr. Officer. So I go out to the pay phone and I lean my head against the wall and I fall asleep standing at the pay phone. About 15, 20 minutes later, I wake up, realize, oh, crap, I'm standing outside, head against the payphone, and I get in my car completely disoriented. The cop's still sitting there because he was going to make sure I made a phone call. And so I pull out, and sure enough, boo, everything changed right then. And so I went to jail, and uh, there was some young black kids in there, very, very young black kids. And uh, they had, were arrested for having a couple joints on them. I, I got to meet with the commissioner. They're like, hey, you're a, a senior sales engineer at Verizon. We're going to go ahead and release you on your own recognizance because you're a valued member of the community kind of thing. Right. But I'm waiting for my release. I'm talking to these young kids in the jail cell because we're all grouped in there with burlap blankets. It's horrible. And, um, you know, they're like, yeah, man, they're going to hold us here for three weeks, you know, until our court date. I was like, what? And it was in that moment that I realized something ain't right. And, and it may be obvious to everybody. It's obvious to me now, obviously. <laughs> but at that moment, it wasn't so obvious. And um, I that really got the wheels crank in emotion now, i'm in a fight or flight mode myself now because after all these years of being clean and sober and working a good job and finishing grad school and all this stuff now all of a sudden i'm dealing with the police i'm dealing with a record for my first time you know i'm dealing with oh my god and my daughter's birthday party was the next day and so my now ex-wife told me not to even come home told me to stay at my parents so my kids knew what happened It was incredibly horrific. Um, I ended up getting uh, probation before judgment. I pled down to a misdemeanor possession charge, which stayed on my record for 10 years and destroyed my career, really. I mean, destroyed so much, just that one little mark. And, uh, you know, I, I never forget the impact of that. And so that fundamentally changed probably everything about me and um i hadn't it hadn't morphed to politics yet because i still didn't fully understand the interrelationships between real life and political life real life and legislation real life and the way laws are constructed and what they're there to protect and so forth so i had a lot to learn but that was the gateway that was the um that was the aha moment that i needed to say i have to figure something out because something isn't right And uh, it does suck that it takes tragedy sometimes to wake people up, but you only know what you know. This is the problem I have with people that hate conservatives is that I I don't care for them personally myself either, but there, but by the grace of God, go I, so to speak. In fact, there once was I. And so I feel like- I I gotta say real quick, not to interrupt you, but I mean, 
we may be on the opposite side of conservatives, but I remember when I was in college, you know, I feel like every guy who, who is left wing now probably maybe had that period that I think every young man, especially young white men, unfortunately have in their teen years or college years where they go libertarian for a while. So I, I think we've all had our like experiences with conservatism or libertarianism because we're so entrenched in those kind of ideologies in this country. Yep. I I agree a hundred percent. But the thing was that I think the thing that attracted me to that libertarianism at that point was I felt like it was anti-war and it was anti-drug war. And having experienced what I experienced that night, I didn't hear the Democrats be an anti-drug war. I heard them being tough on crime too. So the only people that I heard of making any kind of a coherent argument, now I didn't, I still didn't have the economics down, man. You know, I was still way, way off on economics, but it, way, way off. Like I'm, I'm like not even, I haven't even come to that point where any of these things matter. I'm still struggling through getting degrees. You know what I mean? And I'm getting pumped full of stuff from the CFO of us air at the time or United airlines, who was a very much a Reagan guy talking trickle down and all the other things that go with that. So if you consider even where my school was from, you know, even when you consider all those factors, I was still getting reinforced this neoliberal uh, right wing perspective on on makers and takers, Ayn Rand logic. You know, I did the whole fountainhead, you know, all the other things that go with that, you know, uh, John Galt, who is John Galt, right? Um, so I, I, I went through my Ayn Rand here. In fact, funny when i was going for my phd shortly after i graduated in 2009 uh, 2008 was when i graduated with my second degree but when i lost my job in 2009 i decided that i would try and go and get my phd and during that time i was actually writing objectivist shit i was actually doing research on ayn rand and objectivism and um it went over like a, a lead balloon but I was doing it because it was like, oh, this is so empowering, makers and takers and blah, 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 and, you know. But it, it made me really evaluate some things. And shortly thereafter, um, I can't explain how grossed out I was by the attacks on Barack Obama at that time. And it wasn't that Barack Obama was good so much as it was they weren't even talking about substantive things. It was always about Barry or something about him being, you know, black and not born in this country. And, you know, all these weird birther type things. Trump was very instrumental even back then on, you know, and, and I, it really dislodged me from the Republican Party big time right there. And I think the thing that really finally kicked the door open was when Ron Paul was kind of left off of the stage. He had won Iowa, he or not won, but he had done so well in all these different places and wasn't even afforded an opportunity to be a part of the convention. If I could and real it, quick, I just wanted to add sure. something there. It's interesting yeah. in that period right after uh, the global financial crisis, because I think people forget there were like weird overlaps uh, between like, the, the Ron Paul contingent and the Bernie Sanders contingent, even if they disagreed on their reasoning. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, Ron Paul was for, you know, uh, breaking up the big banks and also the Bernie Sanders uh, types were. Now, it was for different, very different reasons, but you could see why people would find Ron Paul appealing because of things like that. Absolutely. Well, now Ron Paul, it couldn't be a more counter to everything that I stand for. I, not, I mean, there are moments where you accidentally... Like in your your Venn diagram, I accidentally will touch points. You know, okay, we got an agreement here. Don't get excited because it doesn't last long. <laughs> I mean, but you know, you can see the appeal um, when government doesn't do for you what it says it's supposed to do for you. You become disaffected when you think of it. There is no alternative, or Tina, as they say. Um, That's you an start old Thatcher line, I think. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, that whole there is no alternative mindset. You start looking for something that's completely out there. And that's where libertarianism became, you know, a bit of an answer to some of the problems. But then I started realizing government being feckless isn't 
a requirement. It doesn't have to be feckless. It is feckless because, you know, and, and mind you, some of these things I learned much later as I got into Howard Zinn and started reading Marxist Lenin Asteria, started diving into, you know, more, you know, state theory and understanding uh, really, I guess, the, the history of struggle, right? I started really going into labor and started digging into history. And it, it, the, the metamorphosis was immense because once I, imagine like it's gross but imagine you're like shooing a, a cow that has got a a cavity in its foot right and as you're shaving the thing down all of a sudden you release the pressure and it just explodes with all the pent-up fluid inside that's what happened to me it, it was more than a mushroom cloud it was like an eruption of change happened um all the toxicity that you know i had for others became a matter of the system. I see the system is fucked up. Excuse my French. I just see, I see things very differently. And it just like, the more you learn, the more is revealed, the more layers of the onion peel back, the more it becomes, you know, obvious. And some things that are obvious, you find out just ain't so also they're veneer hiding a real thing. And they're things that you swear are happening. Like the idea of bonds funding the government, the bonds are sold after the funding has already occurred. So how in the world did that happen? Where'd the money come to pre-fund it then, huh? And why is it you can only buy bonds with U.S. dollars? You know, all these things started coming to my head. And, and But if you don't know those things, if you don't understand the United States government creates dollars every time it spends and deletes them every time it taxes kind of thing, you end up in this belief that they're just printing money and you've got all these other thoughts that stem from that one incorrect thought. And it just, all those neural patterns in your brain, all those synapses firing are firing in the wrong direction. And so the processes by which you process those inputs, outputs, tools, and techniques of what you're thinking about, you end up in the wrong place altogether. And so little by little, the reprogramming of the brain has transformed me into what I would consider to be like an MMT informed leftist, AKA socialist, um, but not in the, uh, you know, I understand the role of taxes, right? So I don't just say eat the rich. I mean, yeah, you might want to eat them because you don't want them to have the power, but I'm not looking for their money. I'm not going to deify the rich to have them pay for programs because, that's not how it's done. When you tax the rich, you're just literally purging reserves. You're deleting money. In order to have new money spent, you've got to actually pass a bill that puts new money into the economy to spend because they never reuse tax. That was the big what the hell did I just say moment was realizing the function of taxes. And, and, and so this puts me at odds frequently with my leftist brothers and sisters because they still are hung up in this commodity money idea because Marx wrote about commodity money and volumes one through three of capital. They didn't understand that that was best Marx knew. They didn't know Friedrich Knapp and state theory of money. They didn't understand that the government is the creator of the dollar. So it's not like it came out of barter or some other thing. These are debt arrangements through the law. Law creates these dollars, these inches, these pounds, these units of measure. And so that fundamentally changed literally everything. So if you could, um, for people that are unfamiliar um, with MMT, how would you sort of introduce it to them or, or sum it up? Say, say my mom or, or, or my brother's listening to this show and they're not that political uh, and, and you're wanting to explain it to them. Well, think of MMT as a lens. And if you look at the background, I mean, MMT shows you, cuts out all the squiggles and wild stuff and it just explains how a fiat currency works really um it, we we've we had been on the gold standard of some sort of gold standard all the way up to 1972 when richard nixon removed us from the Bretton woods accord and what that was was basically a worldwide dollar standard that the dollar was then pegged to a gold standard okay so this is kind of how we came up with dollar hegemony uh, through the Bretton Woods Accord, really that and the um, working with the Saudis to price oil in U.S. dollars as well. You frequently hear people talking about the petrodollar, blah, blah, blah. It really is just more of a, a numeraire. In other words, it's like a, we're going to represent, 
you know, X, Y, Z and Chuck E. Cheese bucks. You know, it's not, it's not a thing. It's not a real thing. It's not like somehow or another that changes the value of the dollar. It just means that people use the dollar, which allows a special access to their markets because now they're flooded. They have U.S. dollars, so it allows us to do business with them. Anyway, but the point of MMT is this. A government that issues its own currency can never go broke on debt denominated in its own currency. It can buy anything that's for sale in U.S. dollars, okay? And, and so that moment there, we don't borrow our own money. We create our own money, okay? That was a big moment for me to realize. So what is the national debt? The national debt is the sum total of every untaxed dollar in the economy. That's what the national debt is. So you want to eliminate the debt. That means you're going to literally get rid of all the money in the economy. That's... Those are the moments that you go, oh, crap. Okay, I get it now, right? Um, so MMT is a lens that shows us how like federal finance works. It's the plumbing. So there's nothing fancy or sexy about it. It just shows you money is created. Congress passes a law. They issue instructions in that law to the Federal Reserve, who then in turn credits the Treasury's accounts. The Treasury and the Fed have what they call a consolidated balance sheet. Basically, one person's X is one person's Y, but, you know, double entry accounting. But it's really one converged view. It, it, it really, when Congress tells them to make deposits, your Federal Reserve takes one of these things, keystrokes those things into a deposit. Where did that $1,000 come from? He hit it on the keyboard, right? It's not like they dug it up. It's not like they went out there scouring the world mining for Bitcoin, they literally keystroke that dollar into existence. And it comes with the full faith and credit of the United States government. Uh, and our full productive capacity is what backs it up. And you ask yourself, okay, well, wh why do I need this dollar? Well, you need this dollar because you got to pay taxes in this dollar. So the government uses tax to keep the dollar in play. Like, the government tries to provision itself to, we need a standing army. Okay. We need a road made. We need a school built, whatever. Well, it's not the tax that actually pays for those things, but in order to get people to work, to do those things, the government has to be able to give you a dollar. Well, you look at this piece of paper or this digit in your bank account and you're like, what good is that? I don't need that. And you go way back in the early days when fiat currency even became a thing. And you're saying, Hey, how do I how do I build an aqueduct? How do I build a standing army? And they're like, "We'll give you ten of these gold coins." And the guy's sitting there thinking, "I go fishing off my back of my porch. I farm my own food. What do I need with your gold coin?" And the king's like, "Ah, you're right. How about if I put a tax on your house, payable only in this gold coin? Would you? What would you do for it? Well, how do I get those gold coins?" Oh, thank you for saying that. We need to build an aqueduct. We need to build a standing army. We need to build a road. We need to build the Colosseum, whatever it is. And so this is how fiat currency maintains its staying power. That's why everybody says they're going to end the dollar. It's like, yeah, the minute that the government is no longer to tax, then sure, I'll buy your argument. But as long as they can tax, you can't pay your taxes with Bitcoin. You can't pay your taxes with Ethereum. You can't pay your taxes with Dogecoin. And you can't pay your ta taxes with chicken necks or sexual favors. So if you think about it, the tax is what drives the need for currency that gets the engine of the economy going because taxes create buyers and sellers of goods, number one. And number two, this is probably the, the more important point for people like you and I. Taxes also were the thing that created the first unemployed person, because once they instituted a tax, you had to do something to get the money to pay the tax. Those obligations, those fines, those fees, those penalties that are only payable in U.S. dollars are what provides that necessary obligation to keep it going. And this this is really the engine that MMT teaches us. Once you understand government is the creator of the dollar. Now, let me break it down one level further than that. You play a monopoly or something like that, okay? You have a currency issuer. 
There's one currency issuer and that in this case, it's the bank, but the bank is the federal government. The federal government has given agency through the Federal Reserve Act in 1913 to the Federal Reserve to operate as the nation's central bank. Conspiracies be damned. OK, that's the fact, Jack. OK, so Congress alone has control over Congress if Congress wanted to. And they have done this many times over the course of history, changed the charter of the Fed. There has been push pull between the two entities where it's like they want more autonomy. They want more uh, freedom from the political process so that they can make what they consider to be good decisions without the pressure of politics weighing in on the financial markets. Um, so there's this air of independence, but it's very much overblown because the fact is, is if Congress says spend the money, the Federal Reserve keystrokes those things into the Treasury's account, period. You know, it's, it's, it's period. <laughs> it's just period. So, you know, and, and at the end of the day, the Federal Reserve stays in business, so to speak, uh, by certain. I think they get like a six percent of their uh you know, the coverage, the interest, if you will, on uh, whatever kinds of investments they pour the money into, they keep the operating expenses and like a certain percentage of product. The rest goes back to the treasury and money in the treasury's hands is nothing at all because money doesn't really exist within the government. The government itself creates money, if that makes sense. Um, so, it, it, at the end of the day, MMT describes the way a currency issuing government operates. It describes the nature of currency, and it kind of gives you the guardrails for understanding the impacts of certain behaviors. Helps us debunk a lot of myths like the idea of printing money. We don't print money, okay? Government always spends it into existence. There's just enough cash dollars, if you will, to cover ATM transactions and bank teller. But the rest of it, that's all 100% digital. Um, and it's never just sitting there in a vault waiting to be spent. It's always spent into existence, it's always new money. Your social security check, new money. Uh, every bill that you get from Congress when they spend on the military, new money. Every time Congress taxes, that money is deleted. There's a there's a circuit here, okay? Um, but in reality, that's that's it in a nutshell. The bottom line is you can never go broke. So there's no such thing as passing on debt to our grandchildren. The money in the economy is the debt. People are, it's like a savings account at the Fed. They they already pre-front load that in, interest. Each, each, when you buy a bond, you buy a five-year bond, a 10-year bond, a two-year bond, a six-month bond, a three-month bond, whatever. Those bonds already, they already know you're paying $1,000 for this at 3% over two years. It's worth this. They front load the, the value of that. That money, the interest payment is expanding the money supply. That is new money being spent into the economy, so to speak. Okay. So this is also a rich man's hedge. Uh, you know, when we have interest on the bonds, again, you would never think of the savings account at the bank, the interest you earn on that, you would never think, oh my God, the bank is going to go under because of the interest it paid on my, my savings account. That's not the sort of thing that you would think about. And it's the same exact thing with when uh, folks buy savings bonds, when they buy treasury bonds, whatever. I mean, when China buys treasury bonds, do you think China buys them with yuan? No, China buys them with their U.S. holdings, their U.S. dollars, because what are they going to do? Take all the trillions of dollars they earn every year and, and trade with us and take those trillions of dollars back to China and hand them out on the streets in Beijing? No, they don't use that money. I mean, they do use it some. If you go to China, you can buy a lot of things with U.S. dollars over there, ironically. But in reality, they have a decision. They say, hey, we want to earn a nominal interest on our money that we have done business here in the U.S. And so we're going to buy bonds with that money. And that's that's it. I mean, there's so much more to it. But in a nutshell, I think the answer to your question is what is MMT? MMT describes how currency is spent. It, it describes macroeconomics. You could say it's just macroeconomics, right? But it really describes how currency comes into existence and how it's taxed out of existence and, and the implications thereof. So I want to get to some other issues, but, but with MMT, I guess the, the one question I have, and I probably get this from, from a lot of different people, 
is MMT applicable outside of a country like the U.S.? Everywhere. Okay. So if you look at Japan, Japan, I mean, MMT is not a, a regime. It's not something you implement. MMT is a description. So think about this. A uh, country like Venezuela. Let's use Venezuela, for example. There, I think, the, is it Argentine peso? Whatever, the Venezuelan currency. I can't remember if it's a peso or, or not, but what Venezuela has done is they have pegged their currency to the U.S. dollar, okay? So that is a fixed rate. I mean, they, they have pegged their currency to another unit of account. So they are absolutely tied to the dollar rising and falling. So they can be very easily manipulated and they also have to find a way to earn actual U S dollars to facilitate their own reserves in their country. That is a, a different story, but you go to somewhere like the UK, the, the British, Ster, the, the Sterling uh, pound Sterling, they, they, they have an MMT describable lens there as well. They create their own currency. Australia, the same exact thing. They're a free-floating fiat currency as well. Japan, a free-floating fiat currency. Even, even China is a free-floating fiat currency. Now, it's got some extra things because the state puts their thumb on the scale a little bit more, but, but I don't have a problem with that. I think that they have every right in the world to be a currency manipulator for their own purposes. Anybody that complains about there's usually some capitalist investor but you look around um countries like or the european union okay this is a very interesting thing because it's kind of a microcosm of the united states the eu gave up each of those countries that are euro adopting nations gave up their monetary sovereignty they gave it up to the ecb so now they're a de facto united states without being a country they have this currency issuing authority of the European Central Bank, and they have like, I think they're only allowed to run 3% deficits. And uh, ultimately, the the countries themselves are constrained to that. They, they can't create euros out of thin air. They have to get those from the European Union or from the uh, European Central Bank. If you look in the United States, you can kind of see the mirror here. Our states are unable to create currency. Our states require the federal government to do the spending. Um, so states compete with each other for tax revenue because states are tax constrained. So when you see like uh, a place like Puerto Rico or something like that, when they have a hurricane come through, we could have solved Puerto Rico's problems till the cows came home. We could have easily spent federal money right on there, fixed them right up. We didn't do that. Why? Because we wanted to allow private capital to come in there and predate upon that. So, you can see the currency issuer, currency user dynamic all around the world. The global South, they're always looking to get U.S. reserves, dollars. So what do they do? They go to the IMF. The IMF gives them loans. Those loans come with a structural adjustment. So they're forced because they don't have food sovereignty. They don't have energy sovereignty. They don't have a lot of sovereignty that would allow them to be uh, free of uh things like the IMF. And, and that right there, I think, honestly, is probably the hardest thing for people to grasp. A lot of these countries, by default, they, they have to import so much. I mean, Iceland has to import so much just to survive. So they've got to have whatever reserve position of the currency that they're doing business with. They've got to be able to have that in their holdings, at, in their country. Um, so you consider sovereignty a spectrum, the spectrum of sovereignty, if you will. You have energy sovereignty, you have food sovereignty, you have production sovereignty, uh, real resources, steel, metals, all the other factors that go into production. You know, And the United States is rich, but not by dollars because we create them out of thin air. We're rich because we have real resources, right? China is rich, not because they have a lot of yuan, but because they have real resources trapped in the ground and lots of people to do a lot of work. You know, so this, you look at a developing nation, for example, and developing nations can implement various things through their federal government or through their national government, should it say federal, through their national government. Um, and it really comes down to what is their spectrum of sovereignty? How much 
internal because remember the key to mmt is that anything that is available for sale in the currency of account can be purchased by the government right so as long as you're not importing and you have the when i say importing as long as you're not living and dying on that because you have no other way around it okay you have a lot of flexibility the currency has a lot of flexibility um but the minute that you are like take zimbabwe one of the famous boogeymen that comes around every time someone says mmt what about zimbabwe right well mugabe mugabe he what he did was he actually took away the farmland from the colonizers gave it to the warriors the, the the indigenous folks right now on the way out the door the colonizers threw a match over the shoulder and set the crops on fire number one number two the warriors were not trained farmers but the people that were trained farmers were gone so they lost like 60 percent of their capacity to create food they have no meaningful production outside of that now all of a sudden they're looking outside their boundaries to find a way to purchase goods and services. So they could have printed a bazillion Zimbabwe dollars, whatever they were called, right? They could have printed a bazillion of them, wagons full of them, and it wouldn't have bought a loaf of bread because they were having to import that into their nation. Look at uh, Weimar Germany, for example, another key boogeyman that they use, right? Well, what happened in Weimar? You had the Treaty of Versailles that imposed huge debt, debt massive debt, payable only in French francs, not the currency of account. So they had to find a way to get French francs to be able to pay their debt. Okay. Then they had the, uh, the absolute collapse of the industrial sector because there was a strike. There was a strike that went on in the industrial sector. So their production went down. So then now after all this crap with the, the Treaty of Versailles production going down and still the, the morale loss from getting their ass kicked in World War I, all that really imposed a very, very bad situation on the German people, which gave rise to Hitler, which is one of the core principles of bringing about fascism, right? Um, ultimately, you could have printed a bazillion Weimar Reichsmarks, you know, and they would have been worth nothing because there's only one loaf of bread on the shelf. And a million people wanting that loaf of bread. So now all of a sudden you could bring a wheelbarrow of these things in, but the printing of money had nothing to do with the hyperinflation. The printing of money in Zimbabwe had nothing to do with the hyperinflation. The printing of money even down in South America had nothing to do with it because let's go to another famous boogeyman, the Venezuelan one, right? Argentina, all that good stuff. These guys have crude as their primary export, Okay. Well, what, who else has crude? Saudi Arabia, America, you know, for USA, I should say, uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia, all these folks have crude. What happens if they drop the price of that crude way down? And you are a country that relies on foreign reserves because your, your currency is pegged to the US dollar. You need US dollars. Well, if the price of crude drops down and that's your one way of getting US dollars, now all of a sudden you're in a real shit storm of trouble. And you've got all this foreign debt, not debt in your own currency, but foreign debt because you have to get U.S. dollars to make your payments because your debt is denominated in U.S. dollars. So their situation is a lot different than our situation. We can create any metal we want. We can create any kind of stone we want. We can create any kind of fuel we want. We've got tons of productive capacity in this nation, tons of people, 350 million people that can do whatever. We're not in danger. We've got water all around us. We've got ports. We've got all kinds of infrastructure. Now, the more we allow that infrastructure to crumble, the less our ability to produce goods and services is. So if you start thinking about how this could impact the United States on that level, there you go. But honestly, too many people say this crap about MMT being only a U.S. thing. Clearly, you see that's incorrect. MMT describes even a bad situation. Doesn't, doesn't only describe utopia. It describes all situations. So it helps you analyze. Like if you were, a, do you like baseball or any sports? I'm a big hockey fan, stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I, I love hockey too. Got my Wayne Gretzky card out and I'm looking at my card. What does it say on the back? It gives you a lot of stats and tells you what teams he played on when he was drafted, height, weight, shoots left, whatever, right? All these different things in there. 
that is kind of what MMT gives us about each country. We can kind of look and see where are they on the spectrum of sovereignty? Are they are they a net importer? Uh, you know, are they a net exporter? Where, you know, do they produce their own goods and services? You know, do they have an industrial sector? Are they able to produce their own food? Do they have their own energy? On and on and on. And you can start building a, a, a kind of a profile of who they are and what they would maybe be able to do with within the spectrum of that sovereignty. Um, a country can put their entire country to work with a job guarantee. They could say, hey, you work in your local community. We will go ahead and fund every one of those jobs. And then as people roll off of those jobs into private sector work again, it's great. But when private sector retrenches and starts laying people off because the business cycle, people roll into the job guarantee and it's no fuss, no muss. The economy keeps going. Any country. I mean, you could see this in Tunisia. You could see this in Costa Rica. You could see this it, it, wherever, you know, and so it a lot of the austerity that you see is completely unnecessary. And they take on these loans because how else are they going to get the goods and services from foreign countries? And it baked into that are these structural adjustments that force them to privatize their country, force them to get rid of protections, force them to allow other uh, multinationals to come in and pilfer uh, their entire resource base. So when you understand MMT, you can see things quite clearly. Again, this picture right here helps immeasurably. It gets rid of all that noise. And well, what about isms? You know, all, well, what about the military? What about this? What about that? It just helps you get through all the bullshit and get right to the nut. So yeah, and, and for people that are listening to the audio version of this, you have a background that has the uh, sort of glasses. They remind me of the, the glasses from uh, you know, they live where you're seeing clearly with MMT, but then without it, you're not seeing clearly. So, yes. Uh, if we could, uh, just to shift gears a little bit, uh, what do you sure. think of what's happening with uh, Chris Smalls and the Amazon labor union victory? Also, I, I think there's been other developments with labor struggles. Uh, Daisy Pitkin and the, the, the Starbucks labor um, victories. Uh, what do you make of all that? And how can it tie into uh, this bigger picture of struggle that we're talking about? Well, first things first, none of these things are panaceas. None of these things are even close. They're, we're not even talking about scratching the skin off of a whitehead here. We, I mean, we're talking about still the pus is there, right? And um, But these are good organizing opportunities. And, and they're good opportunities to get us to stop thinking that electoralism is the only way forward. I think that we've got to realize that if we don't organize outside the parties, the parties, if you've ever watched somebody rolling dough, have you, have you ever been in a pizza shop where they're rolling dough balls and they keep folding the dough and folding the dough and folding the dough? I think of the parties as on the outside, you've got this great populist movement going. Lots of people want Bernie Sanders. And what do they do? They co-opt it and they roll it back in. And now suddenly it's drowned inside the dough. They've rolled the dough and there's this dough ball full of establishment crap, right? I think that the unionization push is a great way to start getting people to think outside the box, to stop thinking about the red and blue treatment, but think purely about how can we as people organize for power, have empowerment through our workplace, have empowerment in the streets, have build connective tissue with each other, right? And I think that unions have typically been very flawed because the union leaders tend to be part of the bourgeois that ends up in Washington, D.C. at their five-star meals at the Hilton and playing golf with the people, and they don't want to lose that access. So your, your union bosses tend to not be the same as your union, you know, donors, your union uh, monthly, uh, you know, dues and stuff, dues payers. And so it's, it's a cautionary tale because a lot of why unions went downhill was because it deals with the devil that these bourgeois uh, union bosses, you know, crafted within the political parties. And you could see like what happened out there in Las Vegas, even with the, uh, the food service group. I mean, those folks, I mean, they, they, most of them wanted Bernie Sanders, but what happened? Their bosses ended up going with, you know, the establishment. You can see this every step along the way. So to me, 
unionization is a way of us seeing another option to, to break free of some change, to think a little differently about how we can organize for power. And if we can organize at our union hall and we can teach each other about labor and get the 99% united in a labor movement, <clears throat> now all of a sudden what we've got is an opportunity to really take on this two-headed snake of, of the duopoly that is both two capitalist powers, two capitalist entities that are private. As you saw with the uh, lawsuit in Florida for the election, we know that the Democratic Party has absolutely zero obligation to run a primary, much less actually take your vote into consideration. They can choose their candidate any way they like. They are a private corporation. Yet our laws are geared to allow these du duopolies, these private entities, to run amok. So I think understanding that privatization, um, you know, is very real, um, and and it has very much control of our government, uh, allows us to see the value of organizing in their backyard through unions because that's where the fight is. We've got to have insider knowledge so we can talk to each other about what's happening. And because um, you're not going to get it from political parties and you're not going to get it from the mainstream news. Now, so I, I want to clarify I, I something good. here, if I could. Real sure. quick, Because yep. I don't want people to misunderstand you. I think you've said before, you know, that's great to, to organize for, say, um, Nina Turner or, or another progressive. But you're saying that alone isn't enough. You know, we have to organize Absolutely. outside the party as well as within that's it. Right. Uh, yeah. We need, we need parallel systems that do not rise and fall with political campaigns. Just think about this, right? If every time you're riding down the road, you drive your car to the point where you don't fill your tank back up and you have to push your car for two miles each time it runs out of gas to get to the next gas station. That's what trying to rely on electoral politics is like, because as soon as the campaign is over, everybody disperses and goes back to brunch. OK, we need stuff that stays at dialed up to nine, 24 by seven by 365, regardless of who's in office. Our, our goals and our objectives never change. They're always to enhance the working class. They're always to provide balance to the spectrum. The idea of us having a socialist revolution or anything like that, it's a little bit it's unfortunate that we even think about it right now because the we don't have the numbers. We don't have the people mentally there. Even the people that have their fist in the air and all the other good stuff, as soon as they realize that they have to sacrifice something, you lose a huge swath of those people. A couple hardy people. I mean, I always joke about this, but like Will Ferrell in the movie Old School, Come on, we're all going streaking through the quad. Let's go streaking through the quad. And he's running. His wife comes up behind him. He's like, we're all doing it. We're all streaking through the quad. And she looks and she's like, who's streaking with you? And he looks behind him. And there's no one there. That is what it's like to be an activist in this country, unfortunately. There's just a lot of excitement for the moment. You get a big old march together and everybody shows up for 10 minutes. They get the selfie. They get the T-shirt. You know, they live stream some really powerful lines. And then it's done. There was no follow through. There's no demands and they don't keep it going. So, yeah, vote, do what you got to do. But you got to understand that that is very, very temporary it is a very, very transactional moment. It's not sustained. And so to me, you've got to build parallel institutions that can survive and thrive in between elections to provide you with truth. To, you know, Lenin talked extensively about having a national socialist paper, basically a press that had the discipline of socialism. And he wrote it in what is to be done. Um, and, and he's written in a number of the treaties that he's written in the past. But if you understand how important it is back then, there was a union floor. There was a uh, you, you factory floor. Everybody met in the factory. You could all walk out of the building together and it made a big deal. The, the machine stopped. Everything stopped. Hoorah. You know, a general strike back in those days looked very different than it would today, where we've got half of our workforce still working from home. We've got people that don't even see each other except on a Zoom call. Um, we have different things.
things altogether. Most people are not working in a factory. Most people are in a service sector environment now. So what does a general strike in that real world look like? Okay, so people can't get their quad venti white mocha because the baristas walked out. You see, th that's an inconvenience. That's not bringing the country to its knees. Now, if you tell me that the truckers or the longshoremen aren't unloading the, the, the packages from the ships and all this fish is spoiling and all the food, you know, suddenly, you know, the trains aren't running and you're not, you know, the, the, now you've got a different story. Now you're talking to me about something, a targeted strike that really brings the country to its knees. Um, but unionization to me is a great first step. It's, it's a way of, of making people shatter the blinders and start seeing that there is a possible way of forcing our will upon a political process that is captured by big money interests. So the last thing I wanted to cover was, uh, you've done a few videos on this, I believe for the Rogue Scholars series that you do uh, for real progressives on YouTube. But uh, You've done videos on resisting the quote unquote doom pill. And uh, for people that don't know, that's a metaphor for, you know, I, I would say just the feeling of hopelessness and despair a lot of people have now, um, especially I think after uh, the defeat of Bernie Sanders, uh, I, I think a lot of people on the left just sort of tuned out uh, or went into their little um, own sectors or, or caves, so to speak, and just sort of cut off everyone else. Um, how do we sort of resist that? Uh, temptation to go into just total doom mode, like uh, we're, we're, uh, everything's over, nothing could ever get better. Well, I mean, you know, there's there's an old saying that if you stare the devil down and you you own the worst case scenario, um, that you stop fearing it and that you can sort of handle it. Right? It, it's like usually the fear of the unknown is what paralyzes us. We stop because it's like we see no way through this. But if you just stare down the possibility that we all die, think about don't look up and, you know, you think about the asteroid coming and you think about them screaming, guys, guys, what's going on? You know, we got look, there's a freaking asteroid coming right at us. Um, I, I think that you can get trapped in the doom of all that if you don't have a path forward, if you don't see a, um, a strategy for what to do. And that's why I always talk about, you know, Vote for your whoever it is you feel is going to represent your values the most, but don't place all your eggs in that basket. Place your eggs in the basket of we, the people, people that are suffering to give them a place to have a voice, give them an opportunity to feel powerful, to give them an opportunity to believe that they can make change. And, um, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of door knocking for candidates, but I am a big fan of door knocking for ideas. I am a big fan of door knocking and, and going to coffee with people and talking about organizing. Think about the old beatniks, how they would sit there in the 60s and show up and they'd read poetry and they'd read communist literature to each other. And they would read all kinds of stuff and get high and do whatever else they were doing. But the point was, is that they were they were sharing knowledge with one another. They were in there thinking about what could be. You know, you see the Black Panthers, they were organizing through mutual aid and, you know, taking Mao's little red book and really kind of infiltrating uh, a, a hopeless community and providing them with a belief in something greater than themselves. I think that's really what the trick is. Yeah, and I, I was going to say, we, we, we should look back on things like that, especially at this moment. Someone was asking me about, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of concern right now, especially after these leaked documents came out. Uh, with the Supreme Court about um, abortion rights. But right, yeah. we need to look back at things like the women's liberation movement and uh, the way they, they've defended those things over the years. And I mean, there was a lot of real organizing that took place. We can't just give up um, right. because uh, something catastrophic seems to be being happening. Uh, same with uh, climate change. I mean, oh, you know, my, grim, my top priority. Go on. Yeah. Well, just think about this. If, you know, I, did you ever see the movie the day after tomorrow? It was a Dennis Quaid movie. It was I kind remember of a, that movie very well. We watched it in col uh, or we watched it in one of my high school classes. Yeah. Okay. So there's this one scene where this one uh, guy, he's a, uh, he's like a, a scientist that saw this stuff coming. Right. 
and he, he's out there with his family on the beach and they're like did they get you yet you know and the boat is like getting ready to c- crash into the water there's and he goes no they never got me and they're looking up and there's this tidal wave coming and it's like gone you know it's just gone and, and you think to yourself that right there is what is the worst case scenario that's it right there so you want to do everything you can to make that wave not hit you you want to make sure that everybody has as much power and time and whatever i I don't want to be that couple on the titanic laying there in the in the bunk as the water comes in just takes us away I want to go down swinging. If, if we're going to go down, let's go down swinging. Because the only way you won't have a chance is if you stop fighting. Yeah, right? That's a guarantee. Now you've doom-pilled your way to a guaranteed solution. And if you think about it, that's what a lot of people do. They would rather be declared. It becomes a declarative. self-fulfilling prophecy. Sorry Bam. to interrupt you. Yeah. No, it's an empowerment of sorts. It's like, if I choose to not take my heart medication, I know I'll die. I have power over my life. I'm not going to take my heart medication now. There, I win. I have power. I can doom pill this and I can say, see, it'll never happen. And I'll be right for once in my life. It won't happen. So I have power. And this is the doom pill that a lot of us swallow. And, and this is what I have a lot of problem with the libertarian left this sort of uh, red-brown alliance that people ignore, they pretend like it isn't real, but this red-brown alliance that has gone on out there frequently t- gets people to become cynical and they mistake cynicism for intelligence. They mistake cynicism for actually having a plan. And so you got a lot of these like salty libertarians with, you know, yeah, okay, yeah, you know, all the almost like cool guy, yeah. And reality is, is that it's just a self-defense mechanism to prevent them from having hope because to have hope is to feel pain if it doesn't come true. So they, they choose to latch onto something that they can make happen. And that is doom. And I don't even think it's necessarily like they think about it like that so much as that's the reality of it is that if I doom pill myself here, it'll come true. It'll come true. And and if you can always talk about the collapse of the dollar and you can talk about all these naysaying things, you know, eventually you might be right. That's why they say a broke clock is right twice a day. I mean, you can force your way into the worst scenario possible. You can force your way into a divorce. You can force your way into bankruptcy You can force your way into a lot of things to hope is it requires effort and effort without hope is feels like you're pissing in the wind so i think the goal here is to give people hope but also provide a path a a a a plan a kind of a direction and uh to piggyback back to the union side of things i I think that that's a really good starting point for finding some hope defining commonality a common purpose a common sense of struggle uh with other people i mean people that maybe are racist i hate to say it people that maybe are stupid or are uneducated or whatever doesn't matter if we're earning a paycheck for a living we're part of the working class we're labor and so if you think about a class-based struggle you think about class struggle we're all labor we're all workers and so the opportunity there becomes great for us to unite beyond color barriers gender barriers or any other barriers and we can fight for our common existence and i think that's how you get to climate change and stuff but let me let me do throw a little doom here. You know, 12 years we were given four years ago by the IPCC to mitigate the worst of the carbon, uh, you know, in our atmosphere to be able to stave off a lot of the really, really negative impacts of climate change. Well, here we are four years later and it's only gotten worse. So time's ticking and physics doesn't negotiate. So if you think about that, that should light a fire. I hope, <laughs> you know, to, to, to trying to organize uh, beyond the duopoly. Real quick, I was just going to add this. I was talking recently to um, a labor journalist. I think she works for um, The Nation now, but uh, Kim Kelly. And she was talking about doing uh, labor reporting in Alabama and how there were, you know, people uh, of all colors and creeds, and in- including Trump supporters, coming together uh, to, to fight against the bosses and whatnot. And it was interesting because a lot of these people that had supported Trump that were involved in these union efforts ended up, you know, saying, hey, 
maybe this Trump guy isn't working in our favor because they got to know these other workers and these people like Kim doing the reporting and they started to realize, hey, this, this, you know, maybe I have the wrong targets or maybe I'm supporting the wrong people. And they actually moved away from Trump. So do you think that's also part of the struggle that maybe uh, some people miss? Well, just remember, neoliberalism is proto-fascism, and both of them require enemies. Both of them require scapegoats. That's why you got Biden out there fanning the flames with China first, Russia second. That's why you had Trump fanning the flames with immigrants coming from Mexico and all, you know, all these different aspects, right? If you can have somebody to point at and beat up, you've got your antidote, right? That's, that's a core tenet of fascism, is scapegoating. And um, and so once you start providing a common pathway, you start peeling away that toxicity from their minds. And yes, well, you absolutely. Expose people to each other, you know, like, yes, uh, you, you expose the immigrants to the non-immigrants. They, the, you expose all these groups to each other and they start to see, hey, we're not enemies. We're actually allies. Yeah. Right. Well, let me let me put a final bow on this part of it. And this is super, super important to what we said. Everything we just wrapped up can be culminated in an MMT message, which I think is the most important angle here. A federal job guarantee in the United States would allow every single person to have a job in their local community, federally funded, locally administered. So there would be no fighting for work with immigrants coming into this nation. And see, so many people, so many people that are uneducated, that are one inch above the pig slop, white people that don't have it going on, that got teeth rotten out of their mouth and are often forgotten and maligned because they're white and because of history and because there's so much oppression within the minority communities that they end up feeling bitter and hatred, full of hatred because their little teeny place above the pig slop is being threatened. And so you can see this with the Eidos movement as well. They hate immigrants largely because they think immigrants are eating their lunch. And, and right and now, for people without- that don't know, not, not to interrupt you, Eidos, Eidos is, uh, I believe, American descendants of slavery. So it's, it's a movement within the black community. But go on. That's correct. And, and, you know, they're fighting for reparations now, but the one f- real flaw that they have, and it's not really a flaw, because if we don't have a job guarantee in place, if we don't put these kinds of social provisions in place that, that manifest in community building, right, then they are going to be always the ones at the bottom getting stepped on. So their perspective is one based in historical reference, historical truths where they have been trashed and trampled on by putting something like a job guarantee, which is a core MMT tenant. Now, all those immigrants coming into the country can have local work, work working in the community and, you know, things that are not competing with capital, per se, things that provide an alternative to working for the man, things that really make it so that capital then has to meet or beat that price to get them to work for them. So you drive wages up now. Now you've got a real change agent. So MMT with the job guarantee is very, very core. It's also the way we get a Green New Deal. Well, I want to thank you, Steve Grumbine. We're going to have to have you uh, back on to talk more about this in the future. There's so much to unpack. But thank you again for coming on Parallax Views. How can my listeners uh, keep up with the work you're doing and uh, tell, tell them a little bit about Real Progressives? Sure. So, you know, we have a website, realprogressives.org. Um, and if you go to our media drop down, one of the drop down menus, you'll find uh, Macro and Cheese, which is my primary podcast. Uh, I also do a show called the rogue scholar Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at noon, usually, um, unless I just take the day off and it happens. Um, I'm also, um, you know, we, we have Luke Parcher on Sundays and we have Jody Newell on Fridays. Um, I'm also a uh, co-host on Tuesday nights on status quo with Jordan Sheraton. And I also have my own show on status quo, uh, called let's get ready to grumble. And that's on Thursday nights at 5 p.m. So I'm all over the place, man. And um, you can catch me a lot of times on uh, Sputnik Radio with uh, political misfits and occasionally fault lines. Um, And, you know, pretty much all over the place, man. It's hard not to find me, sadly. (laughs) I'm all over. (laughs) Well, that does it for this edition of Parallax Views. I hope you enjoyed my conversations with Kim Kelly, author of the awesome new book, Fight Like Hell, The Untold History of American Labor 
and Steve Grumbine, founder of Real Progressives and host of such programs as The Rogue Scholar and The Macro and Cheese Podcast. As always, if you appreciate the work here I do at Parallax Views, please, please, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash parallaxviews. One more time, that's patreon.com slash parallaxviews. Monthly donations of $1, 5 10 15 or $100, any amount will help. It is you, the listener, that helps to keep this show going. And with that being said... Until next time, you've been listening to Parallax Views with Parallax Views to Parallax Views with Parallax Views. The way out is not simply to say don't do it, just to prohibit. If nothing else, if we don't do it, others will be doing it like great. So you know we have to confront the problem. But no, basically, basically, I'm, I know of the great anxiety problems, new forms of control, but it's also new forms of freedom. This is why I always emphasize that uh, uh, internet and all this new digital stuff is a very ambiguous phenomenon, but it's the field of struggle. New forms of enslavement, but at the same time, new incredible forms of freedom. We have to accept the fight with no nostalgia for old, allegedly more authentic communities or whatever. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid.